we should be live f thanks so much for taking the time really appreciate it it has been a while and today i really want to dive into your web3 journey because we met each other a couple times even back in the days in china and you have been always doing interesting stuff you have been entrepreneur for many years right and started many different companies but always focusing on photography, right? Like always working with different types of artists and building platforms for them. And now you're doing something similar in Web3. And so that's something that I would like to dive into. But can you just introduce yourself very briefly for people that are hearing about you for the very first time? My name is Ev. About 20 years ago, I started my journey by launching a community called 500 pixels and that is a photo community that was gathered around the love of photography and over the course of many years it's kind of like started very early before there was facebook before there was instagram Flickr, and many others and over the years it grew to be like a photo community and marketplace gathered around millions of photographers and photo enthusiasts and eventually, it's funny because, yeah, you're calling from China. We ended up selling the company to a Chinese publicly traded company. But my journey for those last 20 years been always kind of like concentrated around either community building in some form or another or photography in general, like arts and crafts, I would say. And so, yeah, yeah that's what I've been doing for the last 20-ish years. I definitely want to ask you a couple of questions about the exit. First of all, congrats. This is awesome because most of the entrepreneurs, I guess, we have this aspiration that we would like to build a company and ultimately sell it. It doesn't really matter if you can build up a billion dollar company or something smaller. It's just like you actually can go through the process and you can successfully exit and have some sort of reward at the end of the cycle and then take the lessons learned and maybe start something new. So congrats on that. And before we get into that story, how did you even figure that you should bring this to China? Because I know that even before you sold this company to the Chinese company, you were coming to China on regular basis and you were building the community here. What was that value proposition or what was that thinking behind bringing a community-based platform, let's say, into China, which it's actually very hard in general because you mentioned yeah. Facebook and the other social media platforms. They're all banned in China. It's so difficult to do this regulatory-wise and even just operations-wise, understanding the market. So what pushed you to come to China and how did you even bring this company to China? In this case, timeline does matter a lot. So we raised about $9 million from Andreessen Horowitz in 2013. Andreessen Horowitz, it's a big company, big VC firm. They are trying to think big. And they were like, you guys should expand. You guys should do this and that. Mm. And that kind of like led us to the journey. Like, well, what are we going to do? What are the other parts of the world that we can go to? And obviously there's a big market in China. But what happened is that we got introduced to a company. Eventually, they acquired the foreign pixels, which was called VCG, Visual China Group. And they got fascinated with foreign pixels for a couple of reasons. One of them is that foreign pixels was actually popular in China before they discovered that. We realized that it's big in China, but you cannot go and search on Google, like how big your company mm. is in China, because it's all separate apps like Xiao Hongshu and all the like local Chinese apps that are not exposed to the outside world. And we realized there is a huge community. Probably one of the reasons why it was popular because we were so niche that we weren't banned. <laughs> it was like focused enough that in some provinces or in some cities on some telecoms, it would be banned, but on a lot of others, like whether you're on cell connection, it would be open and in many jurisdictions as well, like in Shanghai and other places. And we realized there's like, there's some chance there. And so what did happen is that two years later after we raised from Andreessen Horowitz, we actually landed an investment from this same company, from VCG. Okay. And they are publicly traded. They're not an investment fund. It's like for them, a very unusual to do so. A fun fact that in their history, they only acquired two companies. One was from Bill Gates. That's not Microsoft. That's another one. Photo stock. <laughs> so he owned Corbis Photos. And so they okay. bought that for about $100 million. And the other wow. one, they acquired for the Pixels, actually. Wow. So... That is kind of like how that transition happened. But for us, we did start going to China 
only after we got the Series B investment from the Chinese investors. So for me, there was a way to engage the community. So I was in Hong Kong, I was in Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen for a little bit. And the whole idea was to try to figure out how do people use it? How do people use the app? What do people do? And it's obviously completely different. Chinese are very accustomed to super apps. They want like immediate service and all of these things. And All this news coming from China, I was very excited to go back and I'm like, guys, (laughs) we should rethink everything. So that was pretty exciting time for us. Actually, it leads me to another question. What was the key pain point that you think you solved for the Chinese users? Because you just mentioned that they use it very differently. What was the value that they saw in 500 pixels? Was it about the community connecting with different photographers or people that are passionate about this stuff? Or was it more about getting access to pictures and actually downloading, buying pictures, using in business? Or what was really the value proposition there? There's obviously some business case to be made that there is a photo stock component and people like to yeah. buy and sell pictures and make some money off that. Yeah. And that's obviously the business of VCG. So they are completely in a photo stock business. They're having a lot of corporate clients. They're like an exclusive provider of Getty images in China, things like that. So they're like well connected in that sphere. And what we were trying to build is actually community generated content. So Hmm. it was different. It's not necessarily stock photos. And what was happening during the time was also people were tired of like directly stock looking photos of like perfect moments, like very Photoshopped. And they started turning towards this like realistic imagery where it's just friends and maybe family. And that was a big moment for us because we're like, we have community and community can actually go and photograph their friends. They can photograph their families, their pets in the way that they would normally photograph them, not necessarily thinking about like, oh, can I sell it or not? But first photograph it because they are passionate about this and then try to sell it. And because of this, we had a big library. We actually had bigger libraries than like Shutterstock or Getty Images because obviously not all of this content will be sold. Not all of this content can be even legally licensed, but it at least gives an indication that once you open those gates, you can have millions and millions of photographers who are generating content that is interesting enough for brands. So yeah, I feel like this was an important aspect. And also from like following photographers from China, I did notice that they are great photographers and I don't think they have enough places to share that, like where they can actually get a reply from somebody saying like, Hey, I really like what you're doing and I'm going to give you a follow. That's the thing, right? Because when was this actually, it was like 2014. When did we meet in China for the first time? 14, 15, something like that. Between 15 and 16. Yeah. 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 And at that time, I mean, obviously Xiaohongshu and all these places already existed, right? But they were not really that big, I would say. Like not that big that every single person would be using them for day-to-day activities, searching for things, etc. Or at least that's what I remember. I feel like the past three years have been really so good for these platforms. So... What other competition was there really for this in China? Back when I was like focusing on that region, particularly I had WeChat and I had like a lot of comments and likes on my moments that I would share. And I feel like this is basically that social network, the primitive version of Twitter, for example, the actual, the moments, like the way they're shared and displayed and the way people share their photos. I feel like we were sort of competing partially with that. I don't think that like Xiao Hongshu, for example, is a competitor because it feels transactional. Like I'm not chatting with my friends on Pinterest. You're right. I think when you say WeChat, I kind of don't see it as a competition because WeChat is very closed ecosystem, right? Unless you're friends with somebody, you cannot even see their moments. Or maybe you can a little bit because now if they have it open or this, they have some like video platform now that is public, but still like, I don't think that it's a place for discovery to be honest. Or at least that's not how people use it in my circles. And so this is actually an interesting question. And I think people have been really pondering this for a long time. Like why China doesn't have an Instagram type of app where people just focus on pictures, but not like Xiao Hongshu, as you said, just selling stuff and telling stories, but actual photography and pictures. What is your perspective? Why China doesn't have this kind of app? 
Well, I mean, there's a lot of like face enhancement apps and I'm starting True. to think that True. people want like a business model behind that in some way and form. They're like, oh, I want my face to be better. So I'll pay a dollar or whatever. With photography, unless you start introducing some pretty lame gamification techniques as like some leaderboard going up and down or some stickers or some other stuff, it's really hard. And that's why... I am so glad that we're pivoting to Web3 that allows people to connect directly and say, hey, I value this and I want to be part of this instead of yes. trying to either put some ads or put some scrolling mechanisms like TikTok is a great example, right? You just like scroll, yeah. scroll, and scroll, and scroll. It's just endless stream of some kind of entertainment. And then the hour goes by and nothing is done. <laughs> yeah. So No, you're absolutely right. Maybe one or two more questions just to close this chapter, because I think it's super fascinating. How was the process of like selling the company to the Chinese conglomerate? Because it seems that they're very huge because you said that they acquired another company for a hundred million. So they must be a very huge company. How was the process where you leading on that negotiations every single step or did you get some support like how was that process to yeah. actually get from the introductory meeting partnership to like selling the company eventually sure i'll answer in a cagey way and the reason for that is that i actually left the company in 2016 to kind of like reevaluate what's important to me. And I mm -hmm. traveled to Shanghai at first and then stayed in Taipei in Taiwan for almost a year and a half and then traveled in some other countries around Asia as well. But that process was not something that I dealt with day to day. So that was the okay. uh, then CEO of the company. What was happening on my side, because I stayed on the board of directors, I was just receiving regular updates about the process. And it's never an easy process. A ton of paperwork, a lot of lawyers involved. It's a very expensive process. And again, like we're dealing with a Chinese company trying to buy a Canadian company with the American entity. So two companies at the same time with the mirror yeah. share structure. And basically that even raises questions to Canadian government as to like, are we allowed to sell it <laughs> to oh my Chinese, gosh. you know, things like this. So it's quite fascinating to go through with this. And obviously it's not strategic enough that Canada will be like, oh, we need to have our yes. homegrown photo sharing platform. <laughs> so luckily <laughs> that was not, it's not strategic enough. We're not doing like AI chips or things like that. So that went through, but yeah, that took, I think a better part of the year. So wow. first I got approached by our then CEO, about that in 2017, I believe like summertime. And I proposed that we'll just buy back the company, kind of like a bit of a <laughs> backstory there. And I'm like, Hey, let's not sell it. Let's try to do something. And they're like, no, we just want to sell it. So okay. you can see that kind of like process playing out and it took, yeah, probably like nine months ish. And yeah, at the end it's, I think it's very important to have the right timing and for VCG, they're publicly traded so you can go and check their finances. And there's been a lot of excitement about China in 2016, 2017, 2018. Sure. And so a lot of money was pumped into the companies as well. And so with like inflated balance sheets, you can go around the world and buy a lot of companies. So yeah. that's the way I view things. I'm kind of like a little bit cynical about the process after so many years, a little bit cynical about Web3 as well when we get to this, but in a sense, process is just a lot of paperwork. It's about finding value that you can offer to your buyer potentially. When we get to Web3 as well, this is something that I keep in my mind when we're building our platform as to like, what's the value? Because again, we took some investors' yeah. money. So as soon as you do, you're on some specific path that investors sort of anticipate in the end. And we have to take that in account as well. What you're saying is, I like that, right? Because I'm also thinking always along the same lines, like what kind of value you're creating. I guess maybe why you're cynical about Web3 is that you can sometimes see founders, they don't even ask that question. They first go out there, raise a lot of money and then trying to figure out what is the value proposition, right? But yeah, tell me about the transition into Web3 then. Obviously you had this amazing journey in Web2 and you have been passionate about building platforms and empowering photographers for basically two decades, right? 
And so now what is happening with Web3 for the past, I would say even 18 months, right? Like, I mean, crypto has been around for a long time, but for the past 18 months, maybe two years, NFTs really took this world of Web3 by storm. Everybody talks about it. And that's even how I got interested in Web3 or into crypto. It's yeah. because of NFTs. And obviously it has a lot of to do with photography and community building, etc. So, So tell me like what pushed you or again, what was the trigger for you? What was the catalyst? First of all, I recently found my Bitcoin wallet from 2013. <laughs> I was very excited because I also found my seed phrase <laughs> intact and i logged in and i'm like please i should have at least like a hundred bitcoins or whatever it was zero how come <laughs> I what think did you do with the bitcoin I, I don't remember i think i was buying and selling and i remember once i bought something either bitcoin or ethereum probably bitcoin and i needed to sell it back and back then in toronto there is no exchanges you had to find somebody on, I think like local Bitcoins and trust the person that they will send you money when you send them Bitcoins. And I send my Bitcoins, guys like, yeah, I'm going to send you Interact, the Canadian money transfer. And I'm sitting and waiting and there's nothing. <laughs> so eventually I got actually money paid, but that period of like two, three hours while you're waiting for a transaction is very sad and painful process. And so that was the end of that experience for me. Later in life, while we were building Fire and Pixels, every day going from home to work, I would pass by Bitcoin Decentral. And Bitcoin Decentral is a place in Toronto where Vitalik and other developers were building Ethereum. And every day I would pass it twice, back and forth from work to home and back. And I'm like, something's interesting happening there. I should check it out. And I never did. I never went in Bitcoin Decentral or else I would be buying Ethereum at pre-sale price. So I missed that chance as well. But later in 2017, I was in Taipei and you saw the craze, if you remember, all the ICOs were happening, yes. Crypto yes. Kitties were happening. And yes. somehow it was so nudging at me that I actually started a company that was building NFT marketplace for photographers. I have a pitch deck that I went and pitched to a whole bunch of investors. I'm like, look guys, I don't want to raise a lot of money. I'm raising just $50,000 and I want to build NFT marketplace. And they're like, we have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and so I pitched to everybody wow. I knew, everybody who would listen. Everybody told me no. And I'm like, okay, we were building prototype and we kind of like early realized that the prototype doesn't work. So the same issue back then as it is today is that the Ethereum throughput is not enough. Mm -hmm. And the throughput of other chains like EOS and IOTA that were like super hot back in the day, they were great theoretically, but nobody could actually say like, are they going to work if all the people are going to pile up or not. And so I abandoned the idea. <laughs> I actually just like put it on the shelf. I'm Makes like, sense. well, nobody wants to give me money. And I ran out of my money and my co-founder had to go back to university and do some other stuff to teach basically. And I'm like, well, I guess that's on the back burner for now. And yeah, then I worked in Asia for three years for an AI company. And when NFTs became kind of like hot-ish again, I'm like, oh shit, I remember that I wanted to do something <laughs> with that. And so I talked to the guys at that company that I worked for called Skylum. And I'm like, look, I think it's a once in a generation opportunity. I know that I'm going to give up a lot of like my salary, a lot of opportunities at the company, like rising through the ranks, doing a lot of interesting projects, but I'm like, I need to do this. <laughs> and yeah. so I actually quit and started a company again. And that's what we've been doing for the last year and a half. That's awesome. It's actually an incredible story, man. Do you still have the pitch deck from 2017? I do. You're, Sometimes I look at that. I want to see it. Unless it's confidential, man. I want to see it. You got to share it with me. At least some screenshots. That's super interesting, man. Because, I mean, you're right. I definitely understand the pain point why maybe it didn't work back then. Because there was no layer twos, right, at the time. And these kinds of developments, innovations that we have so many of these days. And so you're absolutely right. It was probably not very viable to do a marketplace at the time. But the fact that you already started thinking about it back then, it just tells me that you are on the right path and on the right track. And so it makes a natural 
a sense that you decided to do it now. And so before maybe, you know, you give the elevator pitch of Sloika, which something that I want to hear because every marketplace is different, right? Like it's not that like every single marketplace is the same, just selling NFTs. I don't believe so. You need to have some sort of differentiation. And I do believe that you have a couple of those, but what actually sold you on NFTs? You know, like there's a lot of haters, right? And a lot of doubters. And I would love to even understand, do you photographers in general, like the community of people, do they actually like NFTs or is it something they're still skeptical about and need to educate them? For sure. Yeah. I think it's going to be controversial for a long time. And I think photographers are one of those where it's like, oh, I'll never do NFTs in my life. This is a scam. And there's others who are like, oh, it's a new technology. I need to try it ASAP. So there's always these two sides and we're always seeing some new projects and you're like, holy moly, who is doing this? Like we've seen former president of the United States doing NFT drop and you're like, there's things that are confusing and there's things that are weird, but also there's some very optimistic and very uplifting things. I think for photographers in particular, I do believe that's just a new medium. We're seeing photographers who have passed away, but their estate is actually now getting in the NFTs. And it's just, can you just have another income stream? If you're having like five other income streams, or maybe you have one and you want to diversify a little bit, I think it makes perfect sense. I don't think we've solved all the issues with NFTs just yet. There's storage, there's the choice of blockchain, there is the immutability versus mutability of specific assets. And it's early in technology, but I feel like it's very important to try it. I feel like it's the same as getting a Bitcoin wallet in 2013. Like you have Mm. to try it. (laughs) You never know. If it's worth nothing, then, well, you try it. Hey, who knows, right? You had fun, hopefully. So I approached it this way. And from our conversations from photographers, like obviously we're biased because we're getting a lot of people who are interested in those. And for them, it's definitely here to stay. That's how they see the world now. One more question to this. I'm actually very curious. So when you were thinking about starting a marketplace in 2017, was it also about photography, NFTs, or was it about just NFTs like CryptoKitties back then? What is the difference for you in terms of thinking 2017, 2022, like how did it evolve your thinking about NFT marketplace or NFTs in general? Yeah. Well, in 2017, I was thinking in, I would say incorrect terms compared to 2022. And the reason for that, I was trying to have a platform that can authenticate art or photography at the point of creation. So the very first time you upload it to the internet, you should have either a plugin or an app or like partnership with companies like Instagram or Fire and Pixels to actually put a fingerprint on this particular asset and say, it came from this IP, it came from this computer, it came from this user. We seen this for the very first time on the internet and there's a blockchain record. The importance of blockchain record is very obvious, right? You want to know who did it first and compare it to any other versions of that later in the future. Obviously that thinking required a throughput of like tens of millions of records a day (laughs) and looking at all the blockchains were like, there is none. (laughs) It's just like, it actually have not occurred to me to filter that. So I, again, very optimistic 2017, like very fresh at that. And when we started that in 2021, the new thinking was, is that photos of value needs to be authenticated. So not all of them, but only the photos that have some value. And at that time, price of Ethereum and price of gas and minting costs were in effect advantageous. Like you are not going to put garbage, hopefully, when you have to pay like $400 to mint something. To put like a tiny little record on the blockchain, you'd have to pay enormous money. And so that changed our approach. And currently we are still looking at this in this way that it has to be photography of value. Awesome. Can you expand on that then? So, and maybe you can put it together with like the pitch of Sloika so that everybody understands what is the customer, what you're going after, what kind of market. I mean, you kind of touched on it right now, but one small question I would have to that is like, how do you decide what is a photography of value, right? Like how do you kind of make that distinction, especially if you're saying your experience is dealing with user generated content, right? You're not necessarily only dealing with like celebrity photographers, right? So can you maybe touch on those things because I think they're very interesting 
or very important to unpack for everyone. Yeah, I do agree that it's very important. And so for us, we actually started as a necessity, as a curated photo platform. So you have to apply. We look okay. at the work. So similar to SuperRare in many regards. And then we make a decision to accept you to the platform. Because of these constraints, we actually found some advantageous things. When the market was obviously hyped, people would put anything online, anything on chain just to make money. And so there's mm. been a lot of art that's like low res, that's just terrible, that has grammar and spelling mistakes. Mm. There's a lot of NFTs that are stored centrally on servers, like on Amazon servers. Not a good idea. Yeah. Uh, and so all of those things were basically like different indicators that would tell us that people are rushing. They're rushing to get in on this golden opportunity. And we intentionally try to slow them down. And because of that, intentionally trying to slow it down to build something of value, we realized something very important, that being curated marketplace actually allows us to let people think more carefully about their journey in Web3. And there's so many people that rushed into this. They have their wallet compromised. They have bought mm. some terrible things. They tried to do wash trading. They tried to do like fake transactions. I now have access to tools that allow me to see that all these early transactions from like early 2021, many of them are fake. Mm. People don't realize it yet that this tool exists. When this tool is going to be available to everybody else, they will be like, oh shit, I should have been more careful with this. And so we wanted to make sure that it's the right step for artists to start on Sloika to make that transition. Sorry to jump in. I just want to touch on this. When you say this transaction or this thing is fake, are you talking about like the photography that like somebody stole somebody's photos and put it on blockchain and that's what is fake? Or what are you referring to when you say those transactions are fake and that people aren't right. even aware? Sure. There's usually two types of transactions. One is wash trading, where you basically yeah. trade the same asset from yes. one wallet that belongs to you to another wallet. And some marketplaces so far, like 99% of their volume mm -hmm. is wash trading. Why? Because they have incentives. They have fees that are either zero or very low, and they have their token that is worth something. So people can kind of like game the system. The other type is that if you want to start journey in Web3 and you want to be seen as like a cool artist, you might ask your friend or somebody to pay a lot of money for your art. 100 ETH, 50 ETH, 500 ETH, whatever big amount, and return it later either in small chunks or different wallets, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is that back in 2021, it's very hard to track those things. Like you have to mm -hmm. like manually record them through like Etherscan and like compile them together. Now there's a lot more visual tools that will tell you like, okay, I want to see where this money is going. Yeah. And it will visualize you the whole web that says, well, it went here and then went here and then we went back. And so now that these tools are coming online, it becomes a lot clearer that some of the artists, obviously not all of the artists, did a shortcut to their success, will get exposed eventually. So wow. we wanted to make sure, like we would get on a call with every photographer and we'll be like, hey, every record you do is on chain. <laughs> we know what you did. We know what you bought. We know what you sold. We know how much money you make. We know when you move money in and out your Coinbase or Kraken account. We can see those things. I get notifications on my phone when you're like buying another PFP project, for example. So making sure that people understand this and yes. also tie their online identity with this, like your ENS or your PFP and put it on Twitter and be like, Hey, I'm this and that. It's important to keep your reputation as honest as possible, basically. This is actually very fascinating, but it makes a lot of sense based on what you're saying, all of these fake transactions and stuff. And people are not aware you're right. Like, yeah, if you're a pro trader, maybe you know how to kind of navigate this scheme of different data and wallets, how to track and do this kind of stuff. But most of the people, they, they don't do that. They don't have time. They don't understand it. And so when you say like many of these artists basically kind of, I would say even bought their way to the fame. Can you put some number on that? Like, is it 20%? Is it 30%? Is there any way to say like how many people kind of game the system like this? Unfortunately, no idea. I don't know if it's a big number or small number. Okay. Even with worst trading, for example, there's analysts that are now putting this data together, but they have to make assumptions anyway. They cannot tell yeah. like, oh, it's worst trading. They're saying, well, if you 
bought and sold the same NFT three times in a row, something is off. Normally you would either buy and hold or buy and sell, buy something else in return. But like if we're focusing on the bad side of Web3, hey, there's no lack of new, you know, there's always new right. news about like FTX and Sam and yeah. Duke One. Every day there's some new actors that show up on the scene and being like, you kind of knew that something was off, but then they were treated as royal people. And now they are like either in jail or hiding or running. And so for us, like when we're looking at this, it's fun, obviously, but it also tainting the industry. And we're trying to not, I mean, we're in crypto, right? So like we are already associated with this, but we're trying to take it slower, actually. Like yeah. we're not trying to like, launch a protocol, launch a coin and become billionaires. I don't think it's just going to work. I don't think there's any billionaire that like launched the coin will be billionaire five years down the road, for example. So for us, the journey is like, can we take it slower? Can we learn from fads and from the hype that goes up and down? And now we are like in the middle of crypto winter and actually find what is that valuable thing that we are providing to photographers and to collectors. I'm pretty passionate about NFTs and Web3 in general. So the point here is not to like say that this is all bullshit, right? Like obviously there is a bad side of crypto, et cetera. And we have seen it happening over and over again. But I think it's important to discuss these things and get better, right? And create a system, create a standard that doesn't allow for these things to just keep on happening. And so I get a feeling that's what you guys are trying to do, especially in this realm of photography and in this realm of building this kind of new marketplace model and maybe going back because at the beginning you mentioned that you're kind of cynical about web3 is this the biggest reason like all of these problems that you just described like be it the fake transactions etc be it some of these things that people even though everybody says incentives are aligned but sometimes the incentives are pretty skewed you know with all of these tokens etc that actually encourage wash trading etc so what is the number one thing that makes you cynical that's something that we need to change as a collective to get better well, I think in essence, when crypto got created, that it was a way to take control back from the government and give it to the people. And what was happening throughout the years is that there's centralized exchanges that got way too much control where the yeah. governments are gaining the control back. And a lot of bad actors piled on to actually make a quick buck by exploiting the system for the common man, basically. And who is losing most of the money? Well, it's regular folks. <laughs> it's not the rich and powerful, obviously. And I think this was the ethos of crypto, decentralization and keys and control and sovereignty. And those are being taken away and not by even the governments, but by bad actors that are acting so mm. bad that the government has to step in and do something because they steal millions from millions of people. And in essence... I would love for decentralization to win. But when we're talking even about simple, like can NFTs survive hundred years? And the answer is, we don't know. <laughs> A lot of ethos, even of NFTs is based on like, oh, it's decentralized and you own it. Well, guess what? We pay for the servers. Yes, they are decentralized ish servers, but we have to pay for them. So. How do we decentralize it further? Well, we have to tell our photographers to start their own servers like IPFS, for example, yes. which you can do on your laptop for free, but they have to do this. And then we pay to Infura to provide us some blockchain data. Well, we can read blockchain data freely by ourselves, but Infura made it so easy and more efficient to basically rely on their APIs to read this. And when the fear goes down, well, the whole NFT thing goes down for everyone, <laughs> not just for us, the whole NFT industry goes down on top of this, like in Fura would ban specific countries from participating like Iran and whoever is not, because again, they're like a US based company, they have to abide by laws. And so they start blocking people from accessing like MetaMask in Iran, for example. When you start seeing this, you're like, well, what kind of decentralization are we talking about yeah. when it's actually centralized, but we just don't see this centralization because it's hidden somewhere in the back end of those services. And to build a truly decentralized service, currently it is possible, but it's going to suck. 
it's going to be super slow. It's going to be painful. It's going to be breaking. It will require constant maintenance and support. And it's so painful that we have to make those compromises and say, well, it's sort of decentralized, but we are dreaming of decentralization in full, but it may not come for another few years. And on the mm. other hand, there's other marketplaces like OpenSea and actually like so many more, like Nifty Gateway and OpenSea, they're saying the opposite. They're like, we are centralized and you deal with that. <laughs> this is the opposite. Like NFTs and OpenSea are completely different things or NFTs and mm. Nifty Gateway are like so opposite in what it's supposed to be that it's hard to even reconcile. They want to keep the control. They want to keep the experience. They want to keep the user and their assets on yeah. the platform and they make everything to make it happen. And for us, we're like, we don't want to go there, but it's almost that the customer demands that we go and make it more convenient for them. And the only way to make it more convenient today is to start compromising on even more and more aspects of decentralization. So that makes me cynical. That's a very great point. I really appreciate you kind of emphasizing on that because it's true, right? I mean, on one hand, you want a perfect customer experience because that's how you grow as a company. But ultimately, you're kind of going against the nature of why Web3 or crypto even exists, right? And so I think that's something that people need to understand at least. I mean, we're still in a process of building this thing, right? It's still so new. So I think people at least should be aware of what they're buying into. And I feel like sometimes they don't even know because they feel like, hey, it's Ethereum NFT. I bought it on OpenSea. So that means that everything is decentralized and nobody can take it away from me. And to some extent, what you just mentioned is not entirely true, right? And so I think it's just something that people need to have that education to keep it in mind. <laughs> I would even say to... there's a whole bunch of people that got deleted or banned from OpenSea. And they're like, oh, my old NFTs are gone. I'm like, this is just like you're saying an oxymoron. It's just like you're saying your NFTs get deleted and it's open C full, but you just said those are NFTs. Well, one of them has to be false. <laughs> Either those are not yes. NFTs and they get deleted or those were NFTs and you cannot even get rid of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <So. laughs> exactly. Exactly. And obviously there is many different kind of services right now and, and different NFT projects are experimenting with different things. Like some of them are putting the NFTs on chain, which is the best, you know, what we have, I guess today, but it's still not fully decentralized in a sense that like, yeah, there is a chance that Ethereum is not going to last forever. Right. I hope it's not going to happen, but it's a chance. This is actually an excellent point that you're making because Ethereum likelihood to succeed is probably the highest of all the blockchains, but there is yeah. many blockchains that are likely to not succeed. And so yeah. they still will be around, but if there is no more nodes to write the new blocks, then it just stops and the access may be getting worse and worse and eventually even stopping. And so like, yeah, you have your NFTs, but they are offline for all intents and purposes. And again, like we're entering 2023, it's probably not the best economic times for the world. It's probably a lot of more shocks to the global system, basically like undoing the globalization that was happening forever. And all of this is likely to cause a lot more crypto projects to fail. And so when yeah. that's going to start happening, then you're like, oh shit, my NFTs are actually gone or they're frozen in whatever blockchain. So it's also something that we haven't really gone through. And I don't know what this process might look like. Will it happen? Will it not? It's a bit of a theoretical thing to discuss right now. But in essence, when somebody's minting on a blockchain, that's like not in the top hundred, but like somewhere at the bottom of the list, they are risking that their assets will just disappear over time. Yeah, this is a serious issue. I've actually discussed this or I've been in different spaces before and we have been talking about the same thing that like you need to be thinking about what blockchain you're choosing when you're actually minting your NFTs or when you're kind of committing to a specific chain because like you never know if you're choosing a smaller chain just because it's more convenient, that doesn't mean that the value is going to be there forever. And so I think especially for artists and photographers that are like really thinking about the legacy, about the long game, 
I think they need to be very cautious about making these decisions. And hopefully a platform like Slurka can also help them. I think let's move on from this because I would like to talk about some more positive topics or like some of the more like, what does this technology enable, right? Not how it could go wrong, but what is the upside there? And what comes to my mind, especially given your experience and your passion for community as well, how do you see that intersection of NFTs community plus Sloika as a platform? Because ultimately you're not only, let's say the launch pad for the photographers to get into Web3, to launch NFTs and to have this kind of like maybe an additional source of revenue, etc. But also, are you thinking about helping them to build a community, helping them to add additional features into that? Like, how are you thinking about this? What do you think is the most exciting about this digital ownership as part of NFTs? Yeah, I think this is an important question because people are still trying to experiment very heavily with what it yeah. means to own an NFT. And some of the most obvious use cases, it's like, well, if you have our NFT or my NFT, you can be part of a community. Well, what does it mean to be part of my community? Yes. Well, maybe I have access to my next book early or a photo tour or access to my next collection at a lower price. So basically token gating some sort of exclusive access. Like in traditional sense, that's been done for centuries. If you are a part of this group, you get invited to like cool parties. If you're not part of this group, you're not. So this is a very similar thing. And I'm sure that a lot of companies would love to experiment, not just the crypto, you know, like there's doodles parties and there is board apes parties, but actually just having like common real companies. I don't know. I'm looking around for some brands, but you get the idea. It's like, I don't know, furniture company that says, Hey, if you bought our yeah. furniture, claim your NFT and you'll get invited to like our annual party, for example. Kind of cool. Maybe I love furniture. Maybe I love furniture parties. It also means that people are trying to like find additional value. They're doing some mechanics in a way that like, oh, if you own this for over 90 days, then you will get this airdrop. Or if you burn this NFT, you get something else. So they are basically turning NFTs into some sort of game. And they're trying to find something that works for their audience. I do yeah. not believe that all of this will survive long-term. I think some of them are very tedious. It's like you hold this and then you burn for that. And then we're going to send you this. I'm yeah. like, I already lost track because I'm not dealing with one photographer. I would be dealing with like 300 artists trying to do something simultaneously and with all the different tools. So somebody who yeah. is like trying to put this together in a set would probably be winning. And so for us, it's like, we want to see that evolution happening on the sidelines. So we're not want to be like caught up in the fad, whether it's going to work or not, because we're a small team. So we need to make very careful decisions as to where we put our time, but we have to start thinking like, well, what is something that people want to do? Do they want to give access to like prints, for example, or access to, I don't know, like Shopify now integrates token gating. You can sell your NFTs and have a discount or a free stuff in your Shopify store, for example. Kind of makes sense. It just has to be seamless. You just click and you say, oh, whoever been holding my NFT for a year, they get extra discount or whoever has been my OG collector back in 2021. Well, they're early because now it's like 2030, nine years later. And that's what's been happening with some of the artists like Beeple famously supported his supporters basically by giving them NFTs that they could go and resell for like $200,000 the next day. Wow. <laughs> and yeah. like, if you were with him through his journey, you would know him as a quirky and fun individual and you would know some things and you can answer a quiz that he put together. And if you answer the quiz correctly, you get access to NFT that he can mint. So I can kind of oh. do the same. I'm like, if you knew me for 10 years, you know what I like, you know what I don't like, you know some things about me. So maybe you can complete a quiz and I'll drop you a rare hot NFT that... I can even say I'll buy back at this price. I can like offer you a guarantee of like quick money if you want it. And you can imagine that there's so many opportunities for like celebrities and for different people to start using the same. One idea that I was thinking is that if you're a fan of Taylor Swift, she's been going through a moment where like the first row of her concerts were taken by like rich people that were just buying tickets and not 
engaging with her music, but actually just taking selfies and videos because they're like, oh, I am a Taylor Swift concert. And so rewarding true fans that know yes. her so well, that know all the songs seems more appropriate. And you can like gift the NFT that there's actual not soul bound tokens that you can have the non-transferable NFT. And so yeah. if you have it in your phone, if you have it in your wallet, you must be a true fan. So like, it's possible to start getting those rewards. And I think like not every photographer or not every artist would need such system, but for the ones that are influential enough or famous enough, or even if it's a small community, maybe it's like 20 people that you need to have in your like group, that should be sufficient enough to start figuring out what are those things that move people? Like what is something that you want to be part of? Yeah. Makes sense, man. Last question that I have for you, because this is something that I would like to understand. Let's say I'm sold on NFTs. I'm sold on Web3. I love photography, right? How should a person that necessarily doesn't understand photography, how to tell a difference between a high quality one and not high quality one? What are some of the things that I need to learn about or I need to keep in mind when I'm buying photography from an NFT marketplace? And I'm not talking about speculation. I'm not necessarily talking about, hey, I want to buy this piece of photography because I'm hoping it's going to do 1000x in the future. That could be the cherry on top if this artist yeah. is going to become the next people. But in general, kind of like, how do you tell a difference between high quality photography that artist is really talented and it can go somewhere, it can mean something compared to just like somebody copy pasting something somewhere and just selling it as NFT and trying to capitalize on the hype? Yeah, I think there are several things. First of all, it's something where you have a cohesive portfolio as a photographer, something that you've been evolving over time. So like if you're doing light painting, well, you better do light painting better than others. And there's been some really good examples. There are some photographers like Ruben Wu. He's been experimenting with drone photography and adding lighting to that. So it's a static image of a drone flying with a light attached to this. And kind of like when you look at the behind the scenes, it's in the middle of the desert or somewhere. It's dark because it has to be done at night. You have to attach a light to a drone and you probably have to take like 300 takes of that to make it right, to make it perfect. And so it's people like this that can show their process. So the behind the scenes and also push the technology further, because if you think about that light painting and drone photography in one, well, there was no drones maybe like 12 years ago or so, no DJI to speak of, and the cameras were not good enough to capture like night sky. If you think of this, the Aurora images that you see from like Iceland every day, you know, I don't know if you're like me, I see a lot of Aurora images. They were basically not possible to photograph like 10 or 15 years ago. It was hard. And now you can just have an Android phone or an iPhone and you can yeah. capture Aurora with just a smartphone. So some of those things, that's where technology is pushing things forward. And it's people who are pushing that forward as well. They're coming up with new techniques, coming up with new ways to combine those things that are producing most valuable art. And it's usually others would admire or others would try to copy that. So that gives you some indication. The other part that we, for example, done on our platform is to have the contract, a smart contract where you are unable to add new pieces. And if you think of the art in a gallery or like in a, where you can buy it, you don't know who the buyers are. You buy it because you like it, or you buy it because you might think it's a good investment or it will look good in your home but you're not aware of who the other buyers are. But with NFTs, it's such a social thing, like if you own Bored Apes, you are part of the community. So you're becoming part of this network and you know that there's this influential people that have Moonbirds or that influential people that have Bored Ape. The same goes with art. You can own a piece next to somebody who is worth like $100 million and buying art as their lifestyle, for example. And knowing that the artist cannot add additional pieces to the smart contract, this is, again, something that we've done on our platform, is additional rarity, basically, to those pieces. So, like, you know that there's only 10 of those, there's only 20 of those. And that actually helps to appreciate that, like, getting there early, getting the piece that's, like, numbered number one or number two will also, over time, tell a story. 
that you are the supporter that gets in early, that doesn't wait for others to tell the opinion about this piece, that you believe in this and you got it on the ground floor of the artist rise. So there's a lot of this kind of like social signals that are, yes. I believe, like somewhat important because again, we're social beings. We like to socialize. We like to hang around on Twitter and all of this ultimately is impacting how you would value photography, how you would value the artist. And so there's those several things. The art has to be exceptional. The limitation of how many pieces are available and who else is buying basically next to you that particular art piece. That makes sense. When I'm listening to these investors that are buying these kinds of NFT, let's say photography pieces, many of them are kind of saying like, hey, I would only invest in an artist that I know can generate attention, right? Somebody who can actually create demand around their pieces. So they need to be very good at marketing. They need to be very good at community building. They need to be very good at communication in general, because otherwise it's going to be very hard because obviously when it comes to photography, right? I do believe that the competition is much, much larger, right? Like there's many more people that can take relatively good pictures compared to, let's say, if we look at Picasso, like painting a painting, actual painting, right? I'm not sure if this analogy is the right one because I'm not necessarily an art person, but that's something that would come to my mind coming into the space that like, because of this, we have basically democratized yeah. the way how you can take well, great pictures. If you're looking at photographers, it's the same as painters. If you're at a famous spot, like in, I don't know, Hong Kong or other places or Paris, there's a lot of photographers, right? There's a lot of painters probably painting. There's True. a lot of TikTokers or whatever. So the point is to actually either produce art that is exceptional in some way, and it may be something that only you as an artist can add. Maybe you just carry with you a tiny, cute little puppy <laughs> and you add the puppy in every picture, regardless of where you are. It's like, yeah, it's kind of cool. Or you have something technologically advanced like that person with drone photography or some other technique. And so putting this together is important. But if I'm basically like traveling and I'm just snapping pictures with my phone or my camera, and I'm hoping that I'm going to sell them for thousands of dollars, I would be really disappointed. That's not going to happen. That could have happened in 2021 because it was so new. But as you rightfully mentioned, the competition is so much higher now that those kind of snaps, they have to bring something new. And you as an artist, you have to have this cohesive, like if you're shooting on a smartphone, then it has to be your thing. It's like, oh, I'm only shooting yeah. on smartphone. So you have to hone your craft over many years. Or what we're also finding that artists like photographers, they realize that Web3 is interactive. And so they're learning tools like Blender to put some 3D twist on that, or they're learning music or combining with a musician to make something or animation, or they're even learning to code and make those NFTs even more interactive where something might happen if depending on who owns it and whatever you have in your wallet. So all of those things will become normal in a year, two or three. Currently, it requires a lot of development, a lot of stuff like OpenAI and ChatGPT and all the other tools and MidJourney and DALI. Currently, there's like, what, 2 million people using them? It seems like yeah. a lot, but it also means yeah. that 8 billion people are not using them. And imagine what is going to happen when everybody's using them, when everybody has access to like amazing AI tools, amazing 3D tools, and they can start imagining those things. It's like everybody will have this, as Steve Jobs said, a bicycle for their brain. Imagine if everybody's not on a bicycle, but on a spaceship rocket. And now they yeah. have to start competing who has like the most advanced art. I think it's going to be exciting. But I think that monetary compensation should not be the final thing for the artist. I think it should be, they should be rewarded. I think they should have enough to eat. I think they should have nice cars or nice places to live. But I don't think it should be like, oh, I need to make art to pay my bills. You know, it should be like, I need to make art because I cannot not make art. And I think that instant gratification that many are seeking in Web3 is kind of false. You know, so many traditional artists died without any money, but they were still painting while they were alive and only got recognized after their death. And I think like we need a little bit of that 
patience basically of realizing that it's okay if you're not selling the second that you're minting something, which is for many awesome. is like, oh my God, I minted something and it's not sold in 15 minutes. I'm a failure. <laughs> well, probably yeah. not. No, you're absolutely right, Ed. And I think this is a great time to wrap it up here. I, Man, I really appreciate it. I think we could talk for another three hours because I think that combination of AI and mid journey and all of these tools that you just mentioned, plus art and photography and web three, I think it's just an exciting topic in itself, but maybe we're going to do another episode sometime soon on this topic. But once again, thanks so much for joining me today and uh, let's 100% stay in touch. And if there is anything that I could be helpful with, give me a shout. I'm really excited to see what you guys are going to build. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's actually quite exciting that we're just talking about like all the latest technology and it doesn't have to be yeah. crypto or Web3. It's just like what's coming. And I think we covered yes. that pretty well. Awesome, man. Thanks so much. 